All right, so welcome to today's lecture. We're having a guest speaker, guest lecturer to talk a little bit about what happens when, or I should say, what happens when regular MCMC doesn't work? That's or, right. um, yeah, so let's welcome um, Dr. Vita from Kimor oh. and just sticking with. Great, thank you, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how are you all doing today? Doing all right. Can't wait to get outside. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so don't worry, it's not going to take more than 45 minutes. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, today I would like you to take you on kind of, or, or give you a little peek into variational Bayesian inference, which is this alternative approach to approximation of posterior distribution. So, you know, all kinds of MCMC methods, but it turns out that for many kind of machine learning applications with complex and big data set, these methods fails. So we need some sort of different way to approximate posterior distributions. And so that's what the variational Bayesian inference is about. All right, sound good? All right, if I figure out how to switch slides. Does it work? Oh, it does. Okay, uh, so, so let me just put this all a little bit into the context. So, uh, you know, people every year come up with more and more complex data sets, right? And our goal as statisticians or data scientists or quantitative researchers is to kind of make sense of this data, right? So, so what, what do I mean by complicated data, right? So for example, data sets with many points or variables, right? Many data points or variables or something maybe we don't think too much about this kind of complex data set, which is some sort of unstructured data then doesn't have some clear way to organize them like text data right or what's called sometimes multimodal data interconnected data so for example for each individual i have data in kind of different forms so i have some image information some text information some kind of link right and so what does it mean to make sense of it well we would like to make predictions right we would like to understand some underlying interpretable patterns like so for example in a regression right you want to know what uh, predictors are significant uh, and stuff like that so i think since this is a bayesian class i don't need to argue with you that you know bayesian methods are kind of a good way to approach these problems but also allow us to interpret some domain knowledge right so uh i know that this is bayesian class so i you know, don't need to talk about how you do Bayesian statistics, but I think it never hurts to kind of remind ourselves of like the fundamentals, right? So, so how does Bayesian inference work? So, so let's say that I have some quantity of interests, which can be some population parameter, like a proportion or average or prediction of new quantity, uh, some new uh, some prediction of new observations. And so the way Bayesian inference works is that uh, I take data, some model for the data expressed through data likelihood, right? And some my and my prior domain knowledge expressed through prior distribution. I will toss it into the pot that's called base theorem, right? I will steer it a little bit, and then uh, I get my updated knowledge in terms of the posterior distribution, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, to, to make things maybe a little bit simpler, not too complicated, you're really going to be looking just at posterior distributions of parameters today. You're not going to be looking into predictions. It gets slightly more complicated. So just to keep it simple, we'll just take a look at posteriors of parameters. That makes sense. All right. Uh, so, so right. So you you're taking Bayesian class, right? So you did a bunch of things already. So. You know that getting posterior distributions, for example, in case of conjugate uh, models, it's fairly straightforward, right? Why why is it straightforward? Why that's not really a problem for conjugate models? What do you think? Why is it easy to do inference for conjugate models? What's the trick there? What's the catch? Why don't I have issues in conjugate models with Getting posterior distribution. Sure. That's right, right? I can kind of derive, I can derive the explicit form for that posterior distribution, right? So that's why, you know, when I work with conjugate models, I don't need to worry about many things, right? That's right. But then if I don't have conjugate models, for conjugate models are really just like kind of special cases of things, right? So I need to do some sort of approximation of posterior distribution, right? 
And so you know a bunch of algorithms how to approximate things, right? So typically there are some Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms like a hip sampler, Metropolis Ace things, or people lately use something that's called no U-turn sampler. There are all kinds of uh, right, MCMC based approaches. And so I think, you know, now probably if you did some hierarchical models, you are probably getting sense that, you know, these methods can kind of start becoming very computationally heavy, right? The more complicated models I have, the more data I have, right? So to give you some examples, what's something that's really, really complicated and that would be infeasible to finish before the end of universe, okay? So for example, you can have, uh, some data set that has millions of articles from New York Times, and you would wanna sort of discover some topics in these uh, articles, maybe classify them according to subjects and then build some engine to browse through these subjects, right? So that's kind of an example. And you can imagine that if you have millions of text articles, that's gonna be very, very complicated to handle with something like MCMC algorithm. It's a complicated way to compute likelihood, things like that. Or another example, for, like from genetics. So you can have some information, literally about billions of genetic uh, measurements from millions of individuals. And you want to take a look if there is some relationship between genetic information and phenotypes, right? for example. So this is something that is not really feasible with MCMC approaches, but turns out that variational based inference can somehow deal with these kind of data. All right. So uh, yeah, so yeah, I said, well, the cure to this is variational Bayesian inference. And uh, I will go to a little bit more details into, into the idea of this, but the general idea is that MCMC methods are sort of sampling based approximations of posterior distribution. So variational based inference is optimization-based approach uh, to approximation, okay? So that's kind of the big idea to keep in mind. And so now we will go a little bit more into details. What, what does that mean? And so, yeah, so the first kind of math that we have in here today. So, so the variational based inference approximates some target density that I'm working with. So the posterior distribution of parameters with some simple known family of distribution that's called variational family. And it approximates it so that I will try to pick some of the distribution from the variational family of distribution that is as close to the posterior distribution as possible. I will talk in a minute, what does it mean as close as possible? How do I measure that close? But so that's the general idea. So for example, uh, as a variational family, typically people, pick something simple we all know how to work with, like a normal distribution. So if I have uh, some target parameter with some real value parameter, I can try to approximate it with normal distribution, the posterior distribution. And the parameters of that variational family that I have here as a lambda, they're called variational parameters, that will be the mean and standard deviation of the normal distribution. So I will be really trying to kind of find out what normal distribution with what kind of mean and standard deviation is kind of as close to that target posterior distribution to approximate. All right, so that's makes somewhat sense. All right, so, so now, now the, the thing to uh, talk about is how do I measure the closeness, right? How do I decide that one distribution is close to the other distribution, right? Because we said, well, the idea is to find something as close as possible. And the, the way people typically measure this, it's through what's called kolbach leibler divergence or KL divergence. And there's a little formula here for it. So let me just maybe write it on the, that's the only moment where I wanna do some writing on whiteboard today. So, let so me, don't get scared. There's yeah. gonna be a lot of writing. Uh, so let me stop here this one and let's give it a try of the video. Yeah. Yeah, can you okay, give it a perfect. try? I wanna see if it's the right, like left to right. I guess it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, perfect. Works. Okay. so. So this scale uh, divergence is some sort of expectation uh, with respect to that variational distribution of 
logarithm of ratio between the two distribution. Okay. I have terrible handwriting, by the way. So if you cannot read what I'm writing, just like yell at me what's going on in there. So it's a logarithm of the of the ratio between the variational distribution and the posterior distribution that I'm looking for. Right. So if I want to find out which distribution is closest to this posterior distribution. I want to minimize this. Okay. So, so there is actually a problem with minimizing this as it is. I will write kind of one more line of, of math and you will see where the problem is to actually do the minimization in here. Because if I do a little bit more algebra, I can get that something that looks like this. I will just kind of work up, work with this logarithm a little bit. So I can get something that looks like this logarithm of that variational distribution minus logarithm. And I will just write up the posterior distribution using the base theorem. So it's a logarithm of B of Y given theta. So that's my data likelihood right? times prior distribution. And now divided by the marginal distribution of your data. Right? And so this is the problem why, like, if I would try to minimize this, I would kind of didn't uh, make it any better than, uh, than really, well, it would be really hard to do it because this is hard to compute, right? These, these ones in here. But the good thing is that this expectation is actually with respect to the parameters, not with respect to data. So I can do a little bit more math and I can actually get this out and optimize some sort of alternative objective function that does not involve this kind of quantity, okay? I can write it up just, you know, if you're a little bit interested, one more line. Uh, so you can get something that looks like this. There is a negative sign in here of expectation with respect to the variational family of logarithm of E y given theta. So that's the data likelihood minus logarithm of the variational family divided by the prior. Okay. And you will get here plus logarithm of the marginal likelihood. So this quantity over here is what's called evidence lower bound, called elbow. And you see, if I want to try to minimize this, I don't need to worry about this at all because that does not depend in any way about on these variational parameters, right? So I can, I don't need to worry about this, right? So I'm kind of avoiding this computational issue and minimizing this is the same thing as maximizing this thing in, inside because there is a minus in here. So this is how in practice, this variational inference is done. You're actually not trying to minimize this Kyle diver tail divergence, but you're minimizing some sort of alternative objective function that makes computation simpler because I don't need to compute uh, this marginal likelihood. Like in MCMC, right? If you have Metropolis Hastings algorithm, you get rid of this, this item just to, through the ratio. So here you also don't need to deal with this. The actual speed up you will see comes in a second, but this is kind of first step towards that. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to write on the whiteboard for today. Good. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I did the pin, and then we just go back to the slides, yeah. right? And then let's make sure it's full screen. Yeah, all right, perfect. Should be good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of kind of just want to visualize what's going on, so I have this kind of kind of shapeless space that represents the space of the variational. Uh, distribution, and I'm trying to kind of find out the parameters of the distribution that will be close to the target posterior distribution. Okay, and so so now we we kind of hopefully 
see that minimizing this is equivalent to maximizing that evidence lower bound. And that's actually how people do this in practice. Okay, they try to maximize the evidence lower bound. And there's actually a kind of nice interpretation of it as well. Uh, it, it kind of has the same kind of tension as a base theorem gives you between the data and the prior distribution. Because if you take a look at what the evidence lower bound really is, so here this term in here is the expectation of log likelihood. So it's trying to kind of trying to fit parameter that maximizes the likelihood. Right, so that's kind of maximum likelihood estimate kind of idea if, if we know what that is, right? So there's some tension, some balance between maximum likelihood estimate and closeness to the prior distribution of it, right? So that's kind of the same, same kind of balancing of things that the, the base theorem really gives you, right? So fight between data and prior distribution, right? So there is also, yeah, the elbow, it's called evidence lower bound because it's literally lower bound or it's something that it's called evidence. And that's uh, the logarithm uh, of the marginal likelihood, but that's not really interesting. Just so kind of, I just like conjured this name out of thin air, but there is some reason why it's called that way. Okay, so this kind of makes sense. All right, so, so we have this optimization problem. Uh, so I can really now deploy any kind of optimization technique that I like to solve this, right? So typically what people know from, I think if they do calculus or something, they know like a gradient ascent or descent method, right? So since you're maximizing, you would have gradient ascent method. So what do you do? You compute the gradient of your objective function and you're just updating the, the parameter through the gradient with some step size, right? So the problem of this is that it would took a long time to evaluate gradient for large data set in there because it's still kind of computationally expensive to evaluate the likelihood. So that's why people, so, so, so far the actual variational inference would not be really any faster than, than your MCMC much. But when the speed up really comes is through something that it's called stochastic optimization or stochastic gradient ascent. And it works, don't need to read all of this, this is just a bunch of gibber jabber. But the idea is that the stochastic gradient ascent works exactly the same as standard gradient ascent. But I don't need to really compute the full gradient. I can compute just some sort of what's called noisy estimate of the gradient based on some subset of my data points. So for example, instead of computing likelihood for 10 million data points, I actually can compute likelihood only for 10 data points. I mean, it's, it's this staggering difference. And surprisingly, it actually converges to the optimum fairly well. So this is where this huge speed up comes through, the stochastic optimization. Uh, there is some there is some theory about under what conditions you're getting good convergence, but you know the general idea is the general idea is this. So that makes sense. Yes. So how would you pick the number of observations you want to use? I, I guess that goes into the conditions. Yeah. So so actually no. So actually the conditions. So the the estimate of that gradient just needs to be an unbiased estimate mm -hmm. of the true gradient. That's one condition. The other condition is actually on the step size, really. Mm -hmm. So it, there needs to be some condition on the step size for it to converge, but that's really all. The, the amount of points that I pick decides how good that estimate of mm -hmm. the gradient is and how fast this uh, uh, stochastic gradient converges. And, uh, and it's always kind of trade-off between how much time it takes for you to evaluate the, 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 the actual gradient and so on and so forth. But uh, in practice, people don't use a lot. Like sometimes people use one actually, mm -hmm. just one data point. Uh, that's especially good if you have something where this can be wrote as uh, 
IID data, right? So logarithm of product can be written as sum of logarithms and you can get some nice unbiased estimate through just picking one point actually at the time. Uh, there, there are kind of more sophisticated approaches to that to a little bit play with the gradients to make the estimates a little bit better with not needing to increase the amount of data, like a important sampling based kind of idea. But really in practice, you start with something small and if it converges, then you're good, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if it doesn't have any like uh, problems with how, how big the variance of these estimates is. So yeah, people start one to 10 typically. Mm -hmm. Most of the applications that I've seen, people don't take more than 20 observations really to compute these, these gradients. So yeah, this is how you can get really from, uh, you know, convergence in months to actually minutes through this. Doesn't work for everything, but in some cases it does. Yeah. 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 So yeah. do you take the same hand across the- No, you randomly oh. pick them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's typically, uh, so typically, if so for example, uh, if I would use just one, mm -hmm. what I would do is I would just uniformly, every step, I uniformly sample one mm -hmm. different data point. Mm -hmm. And so in each step, I'm using different data point to, to do it. So, so in this way, you ideally kind of go through most right. of your data points, mm -hmm. right? But since I'm using one data point, it's fast, mm -hmm. right? So I can blast through my whole data set. Uh, I don't need to evaluate some large matrices, which are typically involved in these things. Uh, so yeah, so I do randomly pick the different kind of points at each step of the, of the algorithm. Yeah, good. Great, any other questions? We have plenty of time. I don't have that much more material. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so before we go to the handout and like try to do it a little bit kind of practically on a simple example, I just wanna talk a little bit about some, you know, implementation details of this, some practical choices that you need to make when you, you when you apply this procedure. So so first thing it's the, the variational family. I was kind of a little bit vague about it. It's some sort of simple family that I use for approximation. Uh, so typically people do use something very, very simpler. So if your parameter of interest is some vector of parameters, okay, so for example, a regression problem, you have predictors uh, and you have the coefficients for them, right? So you have some vector of parameters. Typically, you will assume in the variational family that they're independent from each other and that variational family would be just product of simple distributions. So for a regression coefficient, you would just use, if you have P predictors, P independent normal distributions, right? So you would have you would have to somehow find good choices for p means and p standard deviations, uh, and that's it. Uh, this has some disadvantages since, I mean, just by assuming that things are independent, you will not be able to capture some intricate uh, relationships, but it actually works fairly nice, definitely for point estimates. So if I wanna capture posterior means, this will actually capture posterior means very well. Uh, this tends to underestimate uncertainties. So the standard deviations typically of your variational approximations can be a little bit smaller than the true ones, which is given by ignoring the relationships. Uh, of course, there are a bunch of more sophisticated things that can take care of this, but it comes at a cost, some computational cost typically related to that. So that's one kind of detail that I wanted to talk about. The other detail is actually the, actually if you do the stochastic optimization without thinking about it too much, uh, it does not work that well. You need to be a little bit smart in the, the updating step that you're doing. Uh, the good news is that many smart computer scientists dedicate their life to, <laughs> to finding good, uh, updating steps for these optimization parameters. So there, there are plenty algorithms out there with uh, all kinds of 
interesting names like Adam, Ada, Grat, Aramis, Prop that actually do some smart updating. But the idea to make the updating smart is that if your gradient estimate is really good, you can have you can take large leaps in updating your parameters. If your uh, gradient estimate is poor, you will take only small leaps. So you don't kind of run off somewhere where you don't want to. So that's kind of one idea of these. The other idea of these is that you also do this updating independently for each parameter, because for some parameter, you can afford to jump a lot, for the other one, not so much. And all of these parameters do some sort of version of these two ideas. So that's kind of two, two things uh, that people typically do. The good news about this is that a lot of kind of standard machine learning uh, packages, typically for Python, are built with this in mind. So uh, there is really kind of native support for variational inference in packages like PyTorch or TensorFlow for Python. I think, actually looked it up, I think two days ago, there are versions of these as well, like RTorch and RTensorFlow. I don't exactly, I'm not exactly sure how they work. I think they really like somehow call like Python routines actually mm -hmm. on behind. Uh, but it's actually surprisingly simple to code something like this. It's actually very similar to checks. You really just kind of write what your model is and write just kind of simple optimization loop. And uh, for example, taking gradient, you don't really need to do because a lot of these things use auto differentiation en engines. So you just know what your model is. Like, so in JAX, you just write what the model is and the derivatives of everything are taken automatically based on some kind of engine that these softwares uh, do. So it's actually surprisingly straightforward to, to implement something like this. So if you're ever you know, interested in like, using some maybe more complicated models and thinking about variational inference, I would take a look into these, these two things, PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow, if you like Google, PyTorch, if you like Meta. Those are the companies who came up with us. Uh, all right. So, so now the the, the example to, to the handout. If you if you want to try to uh, get some practical uh, experience with this. So, so it's it's just a very simple example that you don't need to use variational inference for, but it kind of gives you idea of what what's happening a little bit. So, it's 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 kind of simple situation when you're interested in estimating proportion. All right, so I think that's one of the first thing you learn in the Bayesian class, how to do infer Bayesian inference for proportion. So we will try to estimate proportion of students at small liberal arts college who use TikTok daily. Okay. I could have picked anything, but it appeared that I know what people do these days with TikTok there. So to do so, we will consider a small sample of 20 students and 13 of which said that they use TikTok on daily basis, right? So, uh, so right, this should be kind of straightforward for us from Bayesian perspective, right? So what is a good model for something like this? Who remembers? Uh, what kind of model for this data would you use? And what kind of prior distribution for this? That's a good choice. That's right, winner right here. And uh, and the prior distribution, I would use probably beta if I wanna do a conjugate model. So we will do the same thing. We will do this just because it's good to know what the truth looks like. So I can assess how well my approximation, right? So we will use our prior distribution beta, a data likelihood binomial. Why is this a good choice, by the way? We already talked about it. What's going to be the posterior distribution? Beta. That's right. It's going to be some beta distribution, right? So that's why it's uh, why it's good model. All right. So I mean, you can pull up your computers uh, if you brought them. I ho hope you did. Uh, if it's not, it's okay. Maybe between Yeah. Uh, and you can uh, you can start uh, kind of working your way through the through the code. Uh, I try to. So it, it's our code. So 
it's not as straightforward as it could be in Python, but I try to do my best to kind of make it as simpler as possible. Uh, but the, the, what you really just compute, you kind of write a function for elbow. Uh, you will use our function, it's called optim, which does optimization. And you will just try to optimize the elbow and you will see how the true uh, posterior distribution, which is some sort of beta, is approximated by normal distribution. So we'll try to use normal distribution. So something that you wouldn't want to get at the end of the day, if you plot the result, it looks something like this. So how about you take a couple minutes to try to work your way through it. If you get stuck through something, you can uh, let us know. And, yeah, so uh, I posted the handout on Moodle as well. So it's a PDF, so I yeah. you can copy it. Yeah, you can copy the code if you want yeah, to. Yeah, and um, yeah, for the remote students as well. So things are um, posted on Moodle as well. So hopefully you get access. And so I can maybe pause here for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, for the good. recording. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can walk around it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have done just two or three sheets. Just Expectation with respect to that variational family. So I was actually using a correction of the presented sheet. So Q, E, uh, to a no sigma of logarithm of the joint distribution between data and the prior. Uh, minus the logarithm of our variational family, which is normal distribution, right? So, uh, so expectation is really integration, right? So this is an integration of what's inside in here, right? So logarithm of f by e minus logarithm of G mu mu sigma. Now times, since I'm using this kind of distribution, right? So times G T e, mu C mu sigma D T, right? So that's what you have in that in that function, right? So it's product of this times this, right? And I'm integrating over something, right? So since it's proportion, it's really between zero and one. So that's why I'm doing the numerical integration between those two bounds over here. So that's what's really doing that, but it's doing the minus of that because optimize optim by default minimizes things, but we said we want to maximize the elbow. That's why we're doing minus of it. And the rest of it is just kind of to make the optim function work once you have this, this elbow over here. Here, I guess. Right, mm -hmm. right, that's fine. Yeah, so here, uh, here we just define what's going to be our uh, variational family, right? We said it's the normal distribution. Uh, and so this is the function that it's going to be optimized by the optimization, right? So it's the evidence lower bound. With the QS variational family, this is my joint distribution, right? And I'm here to find the lower and upper for the integration. And these are the actual parameters that are going to be searched for, right? And so you see that that's what the optim does. This is initial choice for the parameters. And I'm here putting the objective function, right? This is this uh, J over here, right? So what this does, it kind of tries to find best mean and standard deviation. And so yeah, if you if you then print this approximation parameters, that's the, the choice that you got. And the the rest of it is just to plot it in some sort of nice way. So you can compare the true beta distribution, which you know how it should look like, right? Because you know 
But uh, if I'm using, I use uh, uh, uniform prior distribution, which is beta one one. So you know what what should be the posterior beta. And you should get something like this. So I can give you a couple more minutes if you want to fight with it a little bit more. Uh, so and is this considered a good approximation? Yeah, this is actually fairly good. Oh, okay. So so uh, so so one thing uh, that you might see uh, if you actually would compute standard deviations, the variational approximation might be a little mm -hmm. bit lower. The standard deviation that's kind of mm -hmm. typical thing that mm -hmm. happens in here. Uh, the posterior means will end up being pretty close to each other. So this is actually actually fairly good, right? Especially if you consider that this is kind of a toy example, right? To kind of illustrate what's going on. But uh, when you really deploy this into like real pro problems that I was talking about before, you cannot really do MCMC, right? So just the fact that you get something, mm -hmm. that's already an accomplishment, right? Something meaningful. Yeah, so to give everybody a sense of like why some cases doesn't work. So at some point I talked to you yeah. about it as well that uh, for the text data, that yeah. what there's still earlier ways you get some of the documents and then I tend to use some kind of uh, models. Um, we don't need to go into the detail of the model, but at first I was very naive. I was putting everything in that. And I think with only 30 documents, which I think you have one, one point eight million, million right, yeah. for the entire data set. But when I was first into it, I forgot maybe a couple of hundred, it just gets stuck. Like death just froze there. So I wasn't sure what's happening. So I reduced the number of documents I'm seeing into death. I think maybe about 30. Yeah, yeah. It started to run a little right, bit. Right. But overall, it's just going to be impossible for death to do regular MCMC on that kind of model. Like large data sets, I mean, large um, That's text right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, and so the, really the, the power of the variational inference. Uh, it, it really comes through that stochastic optimization that you're doing here. So, so the, kind of the two ideas that, that are really useful here is to turn approximation to an optimization problem, right? So that's kind of one, one idea. The other idea is to do the optimization in some sort of smart way. And that's the stochastic optimization when you don't need to use all the data, but just always some smaller chunk uh, of the data at the time and that you randomly select in each step and turns out that actually you can get good convergence doing this right so that means that you know if monica used five documents mm -hmm. she would be able to eventually exactly. get some convergence mm -hmm. right i mean you could technically do it uh, with uh, mcmc too right but that might took more time than the sun will be on the sky. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get that. All right. Uh, so I think we can we can maybe finish this up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so so I want to just kind of to give you some examples. If you if you want to like Google things at home to see what kind of models uh, are appropriate for this. So so actually some some generalized linear models uh, like, you know, logistic regression that's called generalized linear models can already have some trouble sometimes with MCMC. So uh, variational Bayesian inference is appropriate for something like this. If you do a narrow networks, that's what everybody's talking about these, these days, and you can do a Bayesian version of it, you don't really have any other choice than doing some variational inference approach to that. Uh, there's something that's called deep exponential families, which can actually solve the same kind of problem with documents that Mike was talking about. So this, these are models for unsupervised learning. So do we know what unsupervised learning is? So the, no. you know, what's a, okay. So can you explain us what unsupervised learning is? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I know that supervised learning yeah. is when you're teaching it. With a model where you know where the results. That's are. right. That's right. So unsupervised, unsupervised people don't know what. That's right. Are. That's pretty much it, right? So, so, so typically, what we often encounter in statistics class is like regression. Regression is a supervised a learning kind of problem. You have some uh, data scientists and machine learning people call it features, 
right? And you have labeled features. So you know the response variables, right? For the training data. Unsupervised learning doesn't have anything like a response variable, really. You have some data and you try to discover structure in the data. Like with the text data, right? We have a load of documents and I want to somehow organize them, right? There is no like a, like a response for that, right? So that's what unsupervised learning kind of problem. So that's deep exponential families are models for something like that. Or something that's called Gaussian process. I will talk a little bit about it in this afternoon, uh, what the Gaussian process is, but it's uh, what's called non-parametric regression model. So it's kind of a function approximation uh, a problem that looks it's a little bit more sophisticated than standard regression uh, model. So these things are suitable for variational inference. And to, to give you some examples of what, what people did with variational inference, and if, uh, you can, if you have the slides, you can just put this into Google and, and read a little bit more about it. So uh, people, for example, analyzed uh, 220 million of functional MRI measurements to kind of discover connections between different parts of the brain based on fMRI images. So that's that's a lot, a lot of data, right? Just one fMRI image, that's, you know, that's already kind of handful. So you have millions of those. Or uh, for example, people use variational inference. So here, this is recommendation based for purchases based on 5.7 million purchases, but you can, any kind of recommender systems are kind of based, use variational inference in some sort of form or another. So like a Netflix recommendation algorithm before it's compressed to some form and then deployed on your device is trained with some variation algorithm typically beforehand. Uh, so yeah, things like that. You can, if you have the slides, you can just kind of write down the, 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 the citation. And if you're interested, you can browse a little bit more. So let me just summarize all of this. Uh, before I let you enjoy the, the weather outside. Uh, so, so the variational based inference, right? So optimization based approach to approximating posterior distribution. The, the way why it really works for large data set is not necessarily the idea of it, but it's actually the stochastic optimization that uh, makes it work for large data set. It's, it actually turns out it, it's black box in the nature, uh, which means that you don't really need to do a lot of hand uh, derivations. So like with JAX, right? With JAX, you don't really do any derivation, right? You write the model in there and you kind of write it, let it run, right? So you can do this in a similar way. You kind of write the model down and you let the auto differentiation engine to do, take the derivatives and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, so it has wide support of existing packages. So even though you know it kind of looks scary and a lot of things going on, there is actually a huge native support uh, with many packages for that. And uh, yeah, the advantages, right? I kind of mentioned that uh, the disadvantages, which I said that if you use the what's called the mean field family with simple independent uh, distributions. Uh, it's not a good choice if it's really important for you that your posterior distribution have well captured uncertainty standard deviations. In that case, uh, you might need to do something a little bit more sophisticated, but there are things for that as well. It just takes more work to do it. All right. All right. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have, but. Don't feel pressure mm -hmm. having any questions. Yes, go ahead. Ask back to the code. Yeah. Uh, where do you got the parameters for the optimization? Yeah, that's right. So you get them over here, right? So uh, so so this variational norm that actually runs then this function where this optim actually does the optimization. Yeah. So where do you get the oh this one? So this is my initial choice. I so didn't pick it. I just picked it something that uh, uh, so, so, uh, right. If you want to be a really good data scientist or statistician, you should try different choices and test the sensitivity of your 
uh, of your optimization based on these choices. I picked something that uh, it's probably not too far from the truth. So I'm not uh, having any computational issues here for demonstration purposes. But uh, yes, in practice, this is something that you sometimes need to play with a little bit. So you, need, you might want to test sensitivity of your, of your algorithms to the initial choices as well. If it's a lot sensitive, there might be some problem with the stability of your gradients. So you want to make, for example, if there is, if, if your algorithm is sensitive a lot to this choice, so for example, what do you want to do? You might want to increase the, the number of data points you're using for your evidence lower bound estimation to make it more stable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this is arbitrary choice to a point. And what exactly are they representing? So th this one represents the mean of the normal distribution that I'm using for approximating. Okay. And this is the standard deviation. Because in the end, it's going to be something like 0.7. Yeah, something like that, 0.7-ish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if we start with different initial values, we might get a different uh, optimized. So if you, I think I haven't like tried that many. Mm -hmm. I think that might be if you tried like a 0.1, you can try it for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, the optimization might some get stuck in some local optima so that can happen as well uh, since this is fairly simple model it actually might work for quite a range of uh, initial uh, choices you can try it for yourself uh, what can happen is for example that uh, the opt-in function kind of gets stuck and it tell you that it didn't reach mm. some optimum and then it will be error message and it will be error message that's more likely that it will happen rather than different result. We're also going to have the speaker to give us more to talk about uncertainty quantification. That's right. right. Yeah, so that will be in Rocky, I think, 312, and he and Kitty will start at 315 in the lab. That's what I've been told. <laughs> well, there will be. <laughs> I'm about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so hope to see many of you there if you can stop by. Yeah. Um, All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Let me stop here. And uh, let me.